My name is Maria Del Pico Taylor. I am a professor of piano at Temple University and the director of the Taban Seminar, which happens once a year during the summer. Uh, the Taban Seminar is one of the things that we have created in this school because it is a significant contribution to the health of the pianists in my studio and also to pianists who come from other sources because they want to learn more or because they have been injury and different other reasons. Uh, I was very fortunate to have met Dorothy Talman at the very first piano festival that she presented in Rensselaerville, New York. I had heard a lot of stories about this legendary woman and I was intrigued by it. So I went and I must say that I fell in love with her from the moment she walked up on the stage. She was vivacious, enthusiastic, brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and had a lot to say. I never forget her first phrase. Uh, well, not the first, but the second or so. She said, uh, in many fields of knowledge, we are very, very advanced. But in the field of piano technique, we still feel that we have it or we don't have it. If we have it, that is wonderful. If we don't have it, there is nothing that we can do about it. That, of course, was provocative. So I decided that I was going to sit on the first row every time and listen very carefully to see if she could actually prove that point. And uh, she absolutely did. After two weeks, I was totally hooked. She was conceptual, organized, scientific, intelligent, musical, just an absolutely musical genius, I think. And at the end of the two weeks, I was completely convinced. And I decided to start studying with her in New York, travel to New York every couple of weeks from that moment on until she died uh, in just a few years ago. Um, the question of the time and technique that comes up all the time uh, is, what is it all about? I do these lectures and conferences all over the world. I've done them uh, all over Europe, in South America, various places and so on. And I usually like to find out what kind of an audience I'm dealing with. So I say something like, uh, do you know the name of Dorothy Tamar? Yes, you know, Hans Gop. And then I say, and um, what do you know about her? Or she's the one that does this this rotation, and I, my response is, well, this is not rotation. This is an amorphous movement that has absolutely nothing to do with rotation, because rotation is a very specific, detailed movement that has to be done exactly right, or otherwise it doesn't work. And it doesn't originate on the wrist. It's actually a movement of the forearm. Um, but the point of the matter is that I don't want people to think that everything is so complicated that you cannot learn anything about the Taman technique uh, unless you spend years and years. This is true. You have to have a person who is very experienced with the system or with the program, I should say, teaching you. You have to have the initiative and the um, desire to learn and so on. But there are also some simple things that can, it could be introduced almost at any time to anybody. For example, the concept of the in and out. In the concept of the in and out relates to the fact that we have black keys and white keys. And then we have short fingers and long fingers. So the, the, the long fingers um, is no problem when you're playing the white keys, but when, once you begin to go into the black keys, it's a little bit more complicated because you understand that you don't have to stretch in order to reach a note. For example, if you take something as simple as one of the back minuets, that we can teach, teach to children. Most of the time you see children doing this thing and stretching because they cannot reach that note. But if you realize that the fingers can do the walking, it's no problem. So we move gradually. By the time we are at the F sharp, we're already there. The same thing happens, for example, on this uh, minuet. Same thing, here is no problem. For here, you see the children are struggling to get to that F sharp. But if you're walking gradually, there is no problem. So you can look at, for example, of course, people who teach um, beginners that want to learn to play something by ear. One of the most common moves that you see is this, twisting in order to get to that chord. You have twisting. But basically, if you just move in ever so slightly, move in ever so slightly, there is no problem. And the performance is actually easy and without any um, 
danger of injuring yourself by doing abnormal movements. My name is Maria Del Pico Taylor. I am a professor of piano at Temple University, and with me is Janet Kian, a theater student in the performance department. And Janet has a long history of injuries, but she has overcome them. And I thought it would be very stimulating and encouraging for some people to hear how she did this because she's playing very well right now. Hi, Janet. Hello. <laughs> So can you tell us a little bit how you discovered the Tama seminar? Sure. So uh, towards the end of high school, I became injured with tendonitis until I could not play piano anymore. Um, and my dream of becoming a pianist then was crushed when multiple doctors told me that I would never be able to play piano for the rest of my life. Um, but I had to keep moving on, so I entered college to study chemistry first. But since I really love the piano, um, I couldn't stop myself from playing, continuing to play on the side. And this and other factors eventually brought, made my injury so severe that uh, one day I could no longer write or hold a cup of water. Uh, I couldn't even wash my hair. So it became That's serious. Very, very injured, serious. Right? Yes. Wow. So. What did you decide to do when you heard about the Tama seminar? Oh, so I first heard about the seminar from um, my piano teacher when I was in high school, at, when I was injured initially. Um, she mentioned that there was a professor at Temple University who specialized in the Taubman approach, and this was a technique that had been known to cure injured pianists. So when that day came that I was so severely crippled, um, I remembered what she told me and contacted, uh, looked into this, the seminar. Okay, and did the seminar help you? Yes, so that summer I came to the, my first seminar and it is not an understatement that it totally changed my life. Uh, it not only gave me back my dream to become a pianist, but I'm playing, uh, discovering ways to play that are uh, beyond what I could have imagined. Um, so at that seminar, I found the, a technique that was not only based on a scientific approach, but um, founded on intensive research and, um, right. Yes. So, Janet, just briefly, can you tell us, you had to retrain, right? Yes, yes. You had to retrain. So, how was the retraining? Was it long, short, difficult, easy? How was it? So, uh, needed a lot of perseverance because the Taubman approach is a technique that is very specific. Mm -hmm. It needs to be done under expert supervision. Mm -hmm. um, so, we started from the fundamentals of learning the, uh, the, ba uh, the b very basics of the Talman principles of motion. And um, these fundamental concepts are what ultimately allow a pianist to um, play with the coordination you need to play with freedom. And that can even prevent and cure, in my case, injuries. OK, Janet, thank you very much for coming. Thank it was a you. pleasure to have you here. And uh, maybe in a little while, we will hear you hear, uh, we will hear you play something on the piano. Would yes. you like that? Yes. OK, let's look forward to that. Okay.
Maria Botelho Sigler. I became acquainted with the Taubman approach through Professor Maria Del Pico Taylor at Temple University several years ago. Um, today I want to talk to you about a couple of aspects of playing octaves. Of course, this is a, a complex subject, and I'm just going to talk about a few things that I teach. And uh, one of them, the first thing that I'd like to talk about is that when you're placing your hand to play an octave, people most of the time think that they, the hand has to be formed. Um, I usually like to show my students that if you place your hand up, like up in the air, for instance, and you use the other hand to open your, your fingers, you feel that's very uh, easy and much less uh, uncomfortable than if you actually place your hand already stretched out. So this is one of the aspects that I like to talk about. So using the outside force to help you open the hand to an octave position. So if I'm playing if the octave on the piano, I'm letting the the piano be the outside force, so like that. Uh, so that means the piano opens my hand. Um, the other thing that's very important in playing octaves is using gravity and rebound uh, from the key action to help you play the octaves. So what I mean with that is that for me to just drop my arm using gravity to help me to play down. And then using the rebounding from the key action to let me play up. So if I go, that's helping me by using gravity down and rebound up, throwing me to the next octave. Uh, another thing that's very important in playing octaves is that when you when you actually open your hand, the, the knuckles have to be a little bit flatter because that helps you open your hand easily. And then the fulcrum, the next fulcrum becomes your wrist. So the, the hand drops more from the wrist. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. So if I'm playing any passage, like for instance, this uh, passage from Liszt, Rapid uh, number six. <laughs> director of the Taubman Seminar at Temple University. Um, I would like to say that one of the most beautiful things about the Taubman approach is that it offers a solution for every technical problem or issue at piano playing. Today I would like to talk to you about double note drills. As opposed to single note drills, which are all single rotations. For example, or the notes are played in opposite direction. What I mean with that is that I have to play in this direction, which means to the left for this note and to the right for this note. And that's all single rotations. In double note drills, all the double notes are played in the same direction. So you rotate to the right to prepare to play to the left. For example, if I go like this, so I play the two, I rotate to the right, play to the left, rotate to the right, play to the left. If I'm playing in the same direction, they're all double rotations. So both notes should feel balanced and down, meaning they have to have the arm weight behind each finger and playing to the bottom of the keys. Um, so when I'm playing in one of the double notes, I'm going, so I'm down <coughs> completely. And I go to the next one, I'm down completely on both notes. So my arm is actually down hanging from my shoulder with the arm weight going to the bottom of the key. Uh, the motion gets smaller and smaller as you get faster. So for instance, if I'm doing this, as you can see, it's very small. Uh, another aspect of the 
double note playing is that you group by the beat. So have a feeling that each group of six notes have a new start. So feel the beat. In this case, the passage that I'm playing is from Mendelssohn, Rondal Capriccioso, and it starts with four notes, four double notes, and it starts with six notes after that. So I feel that I have the beat on the, you know, as a new start on each group of six notes. Uh, also, there's a little shape, I don't want to get into that aspect today, but there's a little shape that occurs when you play that. Uh, thank you, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.